Hi, welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Catherine Clark. The Right Honourable Paul Martin served as Prime Minister of Canada between 2003 and 2006. The son of a highly respected and accomplished cabinet minister himself, Mr. Martin served as a titan of industry in Canada before deciding to run for federal politics in 1988. He married the girl next door, Sheila Cowan, and together they have three sons. He continues to be involved on the international stage and here at home on Aboriginal issues. And Paul Martin joins me now to talk about life beyond politics. Paul Martin, welcome to Beyond Politics. It truly is a great pleasure to have you here. The pleasure is mine. Well, it's very kind of you. You have a busy schedule, despite the fact that you're you're not actively involved in politics anymore. So it's it's good of you to take the time. Um, you know, in preparation for this, I was reading your memoir, Hell or High Water, and uh, it's a really interesting, intimate look at the life that you've led so far, uh, both your childhood and uh, your life in politics, but also your life in business. And um, I was struck by the title of, of the first chapter, though, uh, which was An Ordinary Childhood. And as the son of a, a well-known and highly respected cabinet minister yourself, I was struck by that title because I wondered how it could be an ordinary childhood, given, given who your dad was and the way that you must have grown up. Well, I don't imagine that our respective childhoods were all that different. Um, and so I could almost ask you uh, the same question, but it, re it really was that way. I, my mother was from Windsor, uh, my father was from the Ottawa Valley, from Pembroke, and so, but I was surrounded by tons of relatives who really didn't care uh, very much about what my father had done. Sure. This, they, this was Nell's husband, as yeah. an example. And, um, and then when I was here, I went, to, went, I went to grade school and high school here, um, you know, as well as I do, your friends really don't know who your father is or anything else. What they really want to know is can you play football or can you play hockey uh, and that kind of thing. So yes, I think it was a very ordinary childhood. I had wondered how you'd ended up in Windsor. It was because of your mom then. Because your, your dad was from this area originally. And My dad uh, had uh, put himself through law school with scholarships. Right. But also he worked as a cashier at the Windsor Raceway, the horse raceway. Really? Yeah. And so after he graduated from uh, law school, he went off and got a master's degree at Harvard and then at Cambridge. But when it came time to practice, he went back to Windsor. Uh, and that's where he started to practice, and that's where he met my mother. Okay. Your, um, your dad was obviously uh, the more well-known person because of his public career. But it seems in reading your memoir that your mom was the real backbone of your family. What was she like? She was terrific. She was just, I mean, she had the best sense of humor. Uh, she had been a ter terrific athlete. She had been a museum. She'd gone to Royal Conservatory. She, um, and she just, she, I, maybe, you know, to go back to your question with the early ch childhood, uh, none of what my father did, uh, you know, caused any pretension in her. In fact, uh, there are great stories of when she would take my father down. And one of, the, one of her favorite stories was, or one of his, I guess, was, he was walking along with her down Willette Street, which is the main street in Windsor, and my mother thought he was getting quite pompous, and so she sat on the curb, and she wouldn't move, and of course got a real, real crowd, and she just kept saying, you stop being pompous, I'll get up and walk with you. And that story made the Windsor star, and I think it made my mother, and I probably made my father. Did you, um, were there situations where things like that would make you as a child somewhat embarrassed by your mother, the fact that your mother had such no. a strong personality? No, I love my mother. Yeah. And, and I think that in any family where the father was as busy as my father was, in a way as much as my father was, I mean, it was my mother that held the family together, yeah. and, and she, was, she was the one that we looked to. You look an awful lot like her, if you look at the pictures and you see it. That's what, I'm, to that's what I'm told, and I've got to say, that pleases me immensely. I'm sure. There was another funny story that I'd heard about um, a conversation she had with Mackenzie King which your father thought might perhaps lose him any potential for a future career. Um, she was introduced to him, and he said, she said something like, you're, my husband tells me you're a great man. And Mackenzie King said, and, uh, and, and what do you think, Mrs. Martin? And she said, well, I remain to be convinced. 
<laughs> what did he do? Well, the next day, uh, my father, and you can understand this, my father is a young member of parliament. I think he had just gone into the cabinet. And uh, when all of a sudden the man who held his career in his hands came and knocked on the door. My father answered the door and said, I've come to take your wife for a walk. And they went for a walk. My mother and my mother loved Mackenzie King. Wow. And that was a, you know. Um, you, um, well, we all know that sometimes in politics um, a political spouse can be a liability as well that women with strong opinions aren't always widely welcomed. How did your dad cope with the fact that he'd married a woman who was obviously very intelligent and opinionated and could hold her own? Well, but, but she kept her opinions to herself. She was not a public person. Except when she sat down on curb. Except when she sat down on the curb because she thought my father right. was getting in office. That's right. So, I mean, she was never, she never tried to one-up him. Right. Um, uh, she, but Yes, yeah, she held her, she held her opinions, and she wasn't wasn't afraid. And my father actually was quite proud of her. My father my father was head over heels in love with my mother, and uh, so that the, they made a great pair. But she never she tolerated politics. Uh, she, her husband wasn't in politics uh, as per her choosing. In fact, he had was a young member of parliament when he met my mother. Hmm. He was a oh I thought I didn't yeah. know that I thought that. He had run after they had um, been married. Uh, wow. So ran, she, she yeah. in he effect, knew what she was getting into. She knew what she was getting into. Yeah. Yeah. What about your dad? Because you were extremely close to your dad. Yes, I was. And, um, you know, you talked about similar types of upbringings. And for me, um, as a child, and still now, I'm extremely close to my father, despite the fact that... Um, he was away a tremendous amount in my childhood. And also for me, my mother was also the backbone of our family and the one who kept the ball rolling, essentially. Um, but uh, so I was struck by the fact that you said uh, in your book, you talked about quality time, quality versus quantity in terms of time with your dad. What would happen is that, uh, that um, uh, I mean, the, the parliamentary session was in, was in the winter when I was at at school here in Ottawa, but my father, of course, would travel a lot, and then he would be back in Windsor on the weekends, and so we would still be here, but we would go back home in the summer. Right, and all of you. All of us, yep. the whole bunch of us would go um, probably from the beginning of June through to the beginning of September. Right. So my father, and normally that's when the house wasn't sitting, and so my father would be back a lot. Our, the, my dad's riding at that time was part of the city of Windsor, but all of the county of Essex. And so my dad would be dri driving around the county all the time. And so I would go with him on all of these trips, and we would chat. Uh, and uh, my father had no sense of direction. Yeah. I inherited that. <laughs> so he spent most of his time being lost. Which gave you lots of time to talk. Gave us lots of time to talk. <laughs> Did you ever stop and ask for directions? Uh, he, what he would normally do would be to pick, pick up a hitchhiker. Oh. And then he would uh, t pick the hitchhiker up, and he would then sort of get to the hitchhiker and say, where are you going? The hitchhiker would say, I'm going here. And my father would say, well, I'll take you, and then I will go. And the hitchhiker would normally tell my dad where he'd go. But my dad was perpetually lost in the riding, having represented the riding for, you know, my, my God, for, you know, 20, 30 years. Did people take it as a, just a lovely, quirky part of his personality? Well, he or? would advertise it. Oh, okay. I he, was wondering if they would be annoyed that he would show up, you know. No, he would advertise 30 it. minutes late for no, he wouldn't. Well, he would, yes, he would sometimes show up late, but he would leave early. He knew, he knew that he was going to be lost. <laughs> what is it that you admired the most about your dad as a kid? Oh, his, his uh, tremendous, uh, his, his conviction. Uh, my father had grown up in a very poor family. My father had polio as a, a young fellow and, in fact, was partially paralyzed, and there was no Medicare at that time. Uh, and that was, I think, the driving force that brought him into politics was the, the role that government can play in bettering the human condition. And the other big driver was international affairs. He had got him, he had a master's in that area. He was, he was a member of the uh, Canadian delegation to the old League of Nations. He was the member to the Canadian delegation to the United Nations. In other words, the, the ability for human beings to cooperate internationally. Those are the two issues that drove him, and it was his convictions uh, that were that brought him into public life. You talked about polio. Your dad had polio. You had polio. Yes. What kind of an impact did that 
have on on you as a child? I mean, was there a lasting impact to that illness? No, not really. Um, and how did you know that something was happening, that you had become ill? Well, first of all, this was part, there were periodic epidemics uh, that hit southwestern Ontario. Uh, and I it must got... must have been so frightening for parents. Well, it, well it, for parents, yes. Not for me. I was eight right. years old. Right. Uh, and I, I remember coming home and... I don't remember if I remember it, if I remember my mother talking to me yeah. about what I had said. But I came home and I said, I feel like I've got a pl plate in my stomach. My mother, knowing the problem, wasted about no time, put me into a car. I was in the hotel to the hospital in Windsor, and that's where they determined that I had, a, I had polio. I, I remember being in a ward. They had polio wards. I remember being in a ward. I, I have no remem remembrance except for one instance of being afraid or being thinking that I had anything. I was just an eight-year-old kid in a ward with a bunch of other eight-year-old kids. Were you isolated? But there were, or are you no, they were, there were a number of us. The ward was isolated. My yeah. parents couldn't come in. Right. They could watch you. But there was an iron lung. Uh, I had the kind of polio that paralyzed your lungs so you couldn't breathe. There was an iron lung off in a corner. And I do remember, even to this day, one of the boys saying to me, you've got, you've got, a, you've got polio of the lungs you're going to be in an iron lung like that. And I, that was the first time and the only time I remember being afraid. I was lucky. Um, I, full, I recovered fully. And, um, but the, the, the great thing about the sock vaccine, which my father was there very actively involved in, and, and the fact that thanks to Rotary International, uh, we have almost eradicated polio, was when I went to school, um, every, uh, there was not a class that I was in there were there weren't a couple of kids in braces. Wow. And today, yeah. there are no kids in braces. No. Your sister, um, tell me about the role that she played in your childhood. Because in your book, you um, mentioned that she was um, more like your dad, and you were more like your mom. Um, what, what really does that mean? Well, um, we were a very close family. Uh, my kid's sister um, uh, came to Ottawa with us. She went into the, the convent school here in Ottawa before, uh, and, in grade one. I went into it about grade four, grade five, coming from Windsor, and as a result of which, she spoke actually better French than I did. <laughs> and she had, <laughs> she lorded it over me, let me, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, she was like my dad, and she was very bright. Uh, emotional the way my dad was, not the way my mother was. I guess I'm like, more like my mother. Um, and uh, she was tremendous. She passed away a year ago. Uh, she has two daughters. Um, and the daughters are very much like her. One of them is, a, is a, actually a female rapper, among other things. No kidding. And the other one is, works with the United Nations, and she spends most of her time in refugee camps. Uh, she's in Beirut right now. You don't seem to have shown any major interest in politics as a kid, except for getting to drive around with your dad and spend some quality time with him. Um, you chose to go into law, as your father had done before you. Was that just because there was no hope of a career in the CFL? or <laughs> <what was laughs> That's, that? that is just about it. Really? I, I, uh, you know, my great, my great ambition was to play in the Canadian Football League. The problem was that that uh, I either wasn't big enough or I was too slow. Okay, those but are fairly big drops. They, 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 they were, <laughs> and not particularly well coordinated. So right. that really did it in. I, um, um, no, my ambition was always to go to the third world. That's what I wanted to do. Um, I went to law school because. I, I think I went to law school because I really didn't know what else to do while before going to the, the third world. Um, what really happened was after I graduated from law school, a member of the Ontario Bar, um, a very close friend of mine, a man by the name of Maura Strong, who perhaps one of Canada's greatest environmentalists and certainly one of Canada's greatest people involved in the development of the rest of the world. And I, I, he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I want to go to Africa. And he said, that's what Africa needs is another young lawyer. And it, cursed, it occurred to me at that point that he was right. Um, so he was in business. He offered me a job in business. I had no intention of going into business. I knew nothing about it. But the basic idea was I would go into business and I would learn about business and then I could go to the third world. Um, make a long story short, I stayed in business for 20 years. So 
why did you stay in business for so long? Because, I mean, you did have this interest in going into the third world, and it, it is an interest that has lasted you your entire life. When you were in politics, you took a keen interest in, um, in working well, on the international stage. And there, there are two reasons. Number one, I liked it. Right. And it, and to be, what did you like about it? Oh, I, I liked basically doing deals. I liked... Um, I just, built, and business is a lot about building things. Uh, it's about building businesses, about employing people. I just re, I just liked, I think I liked the constructive side of it. Uh, right. I also had a family right. and three, eventually three young sons. Right. And uh, so obviously the responsibility to provide for them uh, meant that I had to stay in business until such time. And that was what I always said. I'm going to stay, do this until such time as I have enough set aside that I can take care of my family. Right. And then you went into that incredibly lucrative field of politics. <laughs> yeah. What, well, what happened, what happened there was, again, it was I was going to go off to the third world. But by this time, I'm in my mid-40s. And I had spent a lot of time internationally in business. And um, it, it became fairly evident that I could do better and do more in, in politics than I could. Or I don't know if subconsciously it was my father's son the family that I had grown up in, but I decided that I would, uh, that I would run. And, you know, in a way, it's interesting because I came, became ultimately a governor of the World Bank, and I was able to spend a lot of time on those issues. And I also became, you know, actively involved in the IMF at the time of the, a, a number of these crises which are affecting developing countries. And so, in many ways, it, it worked out. This facility that you have with numbers um, is something that I admire because, I, I mean, I lack it utterly. And um, as a kid, were you good at math? Or no. You, no, really? No, I, <laughs> really? Was ter I was terrible. No kidding. Uh, yeah, oh, sure. Wow. I, I was terrible at math. Uh, but I, uh, um, I, a psychologist could probably tell you the one thing I could always do is I could intuit numbers. I don't know how. I mean, I think there are mass, vast segments of our brain which, we, uh, which I don't have or you don't have, but you have others. I mean, the pe people who can play music yeah. uh, by ear and this kind of thing. And I don't know why I could intuit numbers, but I think that business, uh, business and politics is as much judgment as it is, as it is numbers. Yeah. You talked about um, having a young family, and that's one of the reasons why you stayed in, in business, which you enjoyed for a, a long time. Um, you had known the woman who would become your life, originally Sheila Cowan on and off for many years before um, it developed into a romance. She was, I think, a friend of your she was my She was my kid's sister's best friend. Right. And she was five or six years younger than I was. And this is at a time when, I mean, when you're a teenager, where five or six years is, yeah. is a lifetime. Although, as Sheila will tell me, it still is. <laughs> you're still much older than much she Much older is. than she is, that's right. Yeah. yeah. How did it turn into a romance? Well, I, I, as I say, she was uh, the girl next door. Um, so does that mean you ignored her for many years and then all of a sudden... Well, she will tell you that she ignored me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I think that uh, finally she... Well, I was at the University of Toronto, and then when I graduated, I went into the University of Toronto Law School, and at that point, when she went to the University of Toronto, and so she, she seems to have grown up, or she seemed to at that time. Yeah. And so we... Um, uh, yeah, I. It did. I didn't really take me very long to fall. I think. Yeah, um, and I was telling you before how much I personally enjoyed her. I uh, had the opportunity to interview her once many years ago, and she was very gracious and and just welcoming and kind. Just a truly generous person. Um, I did ask her. This was a Christmas time interview. What she wanted for Christmas. And she said, in no uncertain terms, I want grandchildren. <laughs> You've got them now. You've got two grandchildren. That must three. Be three now. Oh, that's wonderful. Congratulations. It must make her very happy, and you too. Yes, it does. Uh, it, the, we have got three sons. And much as in, with my mother's family, uh, Sheila is the reason that the three boys have turned out well. Uh, she overwhelmingly is the, the rock upon which the family uh, is is built, and if you talk to my three sons, they'll talk about their mother the way I talk about mine. I mean, yeah. it's, it's uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, I have got three grandsons. My youngest son uh, has three uh, three sons, which makes six. 
Six and so boys. if you six boys, and if you talk to Sheila about that, yes. she will tell you that um, perhaps David could have produced at least one girl. <laughs> no, I, I really have my fingers tightly crossed for. And should she ever wish to borrow a girl, uh, I have one that I'm happy to <laughs> loan her. Well, her great threat when when uh, uh, well, Ross, who was David's wife, yes. was pregnant with the with the third oh, grandchild, dear. was. Uh, Sheila's great threat was, I don't care if it's a boy or a girl, I'm buying that child a dollhouse. <laughs> but she didn't. Okay, Thank well, God. You know what? It's early days yet. <laughs> you never know what could happen. Could happen. <laughs> um, let's, let's talk about then the, um, the transition for the whole family when you moved from a life in business to a life as a member of parliament. Uh, you were on the opposition benches when you were first elected. Yeah. It must have been a big transition for you. Or was it? I don't think it was. No? Uh, uh, it wasn't much of a transition for me. Um, uh, initially, I mean, the, the, the family, the, the difference between living in Montreal, where we were, and going to Ottawa and living in Windsor, uh, you know, was night and day. Right. And, um, so that one was, I was able to, to, to go to Ottawa and then get back to Montreal, you know, on weekends very easily. And then uh, as the boys grew up, eventually Sheila... Uh, moved and came to came to Ottawa on a permanent basis. Thank God, because I would have had a hard time without her. Hmm. Um, did you at any point say to yourself, "What have I done?" No, no. Um, it, it was it, it, politics f was was really. I mean, it was quite uh, an ever changing scene. Um, I ran in '88. The Liberal leadership race occurred in 1990, right. and so my apprenticeship. Uh, was running in, a, in, a, in the leadership race, um, and then I very quickly uh, got involved in in uh, writing the the program with with the Hosek and some other mm -hmm. people, um, which took up an enormous amount of time. Then all of a sudden we had the '93 election, and right. I was the Minister of Finance. Right. So uh, actually, I didn't have a lot of time to sort of reflect on on changes. Yeah, tell me what it was like then to write your memoirs once you left politics, because. You things did happen very quickly, and, then, and you you became minister of finance at a time when um, you had a lot of work to do, and so your days would have been busy and uh, long, and they would have been kind of a blend of many long busy years in effect. Uh, and then uh, you eventually did become leader and prime minister. And um, what was it like for you to look back as someone who doesn't seem to look? back um, or, or really to think that that's a particularly useful thing to do to yeah. look back what was it like for you to sit and write your memoirs at the end of your political time well first of all I, I you know you know you get to know yourself and you're right I don't don't look back I mean when I was when I was in business I didn't look back on anything else when I went into pul uh, public life everything I had went into trust and I did I just walked away from right. it and then when I went when I, when I left government to do what I'm doing now I knew I would do the same thing, just just walk away from it. So I felt it was very important, uh, if I was ever going to write the memoirs, that I had to do it right away. Right. Uh, and I, I, I was absolutely right. If I hadn't taken that two years to do it then, uh, they never would have been written. I just, I'm not sure that that would have been the end of the world, but nonetheless, I, I think I wrote them, I wrote them as much for my three sons as I think I did anyone else. Yeah, I understand that. I think, I think that's a very good reason to do it. Yeah. Because you actually set the record straight, more even for your own family, and so that they have an understanding of their family too. Um, was it tough to write about the tough parts of politics? No. Really? No. Um, you know, I mean, look, you know, politics is, uh, I, there's some things that are wonderful and unfair, and there are things, some things that are bad and unfair. Right. Uh, and uh, but you know that going in. I mean, I didn't. I did not. I did not go into public life uh, with any misconceptions. I knew what it was like. Don't, I had grown up. Yeah. I had grown up in it, um, and um, so I. And I. But I went in with exactly. I think the same. Probably the same set of convictions that my father went in. And, and there is no doubt that um, you can do more in five minutes if you're in government than you can do in five years if you're out of government. 
and uh, I wanted to do that. Uh, and even today, I mean, I don't miss politics mm. at all. I do miss government. Yeah. When I think of all, of the, when I think of the time I now spend on the Aboriginal issue in this country, which right. I think is the greatest social issue that we face as a nation, when I think of the times that I right now when I spend with Sheila and my three sons on talking about this issue, uh, well, in government you can you can make the things happen so much quicker. Right. And I, that's why I would recommend anybody to go into public life, but go in with your eyes wide open. I had a question with regards, and we don't have a, a ton of time left, but um, with regards to your commitment to Aboriginal issues here in Canada, um, your mom, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought I had read that your mom uh, had Métis background, is that? Yeah, I've seen that, that, that rumor. That's, it's not? That's not true. No. That, that, that's so not where, true. Did, where did the interest come from? Was there... A specific point in your life when you thought this is um, I am a pre baby boomer and what is that that means that you could get a job anywhere anytime summer job that there were and so I hitchhiked up north and got a job in Hay River working on the tug barges on the Mackenzie and I worked with young Inuit young Dani primarily First Nations and um, and young Métis and they were my own age and I had all my friends back in Windsor, all my friends back in Ottawa. And we would sit in port some nights talking. And all my friends back home had great excitement about life and great hope. And these guys, every bit as smart, every bit as hardworking, did not. And, it's, and that was because of the deck that life had dealt with them. And I just thought it was so incredibly unfair that I basically said at some point in my life, I'm gonna, I am going to do something about it. And that's why the first, when I was made prime minister, the religious ceremony was a smudging ceremony. Uh, the first thing I did as becoming Prime Minister was put in base, put in place what led to the, the Kelowna Accord. It took 18 months of negotiation. And, you know, if I have any real regrets about leaving government, it's that the government that succeeded mine um, did not carry on with the Kelowna Accord. And I think that one of the, and we don't want to be partisan in this, in this discussion, but what's built this country is that governments of different stripes, uh, vacillating around the center, center right, center left, have built on the activities of the government that came before, regardless um, of whether they were conservative, liberal, or in the provinces, NDP, or old CCF. And that's what's built Canada. It, and um, for the first time, that hasn't happened. And I think that's a real, I think that's very unfortunate. Mr. Martin, I thank you for taking the time to be here. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I wish you the best in the work that you're doing on behalf of our First Nations people, but also internationally. And uh, I'm glad to have had the chance to chat. Well, I'm glad we did. The only thing I'm saying, at some point, we're going to reverse world. Okay. Well, don't you take my job away, Mr. <laughs> Martin. Or <laughs> it's going to be in our spot. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.